Uh, for those of you not familiar with who I am, uh, and you, you shouldn't necessarily be familiar with who I am, I'm a, problem, I'm a troublemaker. Uh, my name is Fortune St. Keen. I come from the beautiful kingdom of the East. Uh, more importantly, I come from the best shire in the world, in the known world, uh, the beautiful shire of Quintavia, uh, which is Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, if you are unfamiliar, um, as again, you might be. Uh, much like ancient Rome, Worcester has seven hills and is home to the greats, uh, such as Coffee Addicted Me. Um, I have uh, been in the SCA for uh, 14 years in July. Um, I started out as a Rennie. I started out very involved with Renaissance fairs, um, and I had been told uh, about the SCA people and how absolutely awful they are uh, and mean and how I would not like them. And does anyone know what the greatest motivator out there is? <laughs> yeah, Spikes. Yeah, I'm spite. spite. <laughs> Full, oh. <laughs> Full force. Spite is the greatest motivator out there. Uh, and so one of my friends who I worked with at Joanne Fabrics, because shockingly, uh, I loved the fabric career track until it spun out on me. Uh, one of my friends at Joann's had a friend who she had gone to Girl Scout camp with, who her stepbrother was this baron of this stone march place. Uh, and she was, she had had a great time at SCA event and she was convinced I would have a great time. So out of spite, I went to uh, the largest war event that the East Kingdom has uh, in our boundaries, uh, which is Great Northeastern War, which I highly recommend if you're ever in the area. Um, happens in July in Maine. Uh, and it has classes and fighting, classes and drinking and parties and uh, classes and court. Uh, sometimes it has an awful lot of court. Um, but I, we got up at three o'clock in the morning. We drove the five hours to Maine, which four, four hours to Maine, uh, arrived on site at seven o'clock in the morning. Gate was not open yet. Uh, we put up our tent, which was a big, beautiful green nylon thing that looked like the skull of a grasshopper. Uh, in the middle of a field, proceeded to get ourselves heat exhausted um, because we had not brought water. Uh, so as the day goes on and we're sitting in the full sun, we ate the only thing that was available to us that was cold, which were the alcoholic melon balls we had brought. This is a cautionary tale, kids. Don't do this. <laughs> um, but by that evening, I was drinking fermented mare's milk at a bar. Uh, and a very large fighter man picked me up and said he was keeping me, and I had the same idea about the SCA. So I joined the SCA. I played primarily in the Barony of Stone March, which is the state of New Hampshire. Um, those of you not from the New England area will probably have the opinion that we should all be one state, but in fact, we're very different, very different people. Uh, state of New Hampshire, and uh, one of the largest events in the state of New Hampshire is Burka. Burka is uh, Market Day Burka, it's a uh, shopping. I think there's a tournament. <laughs> there's also some court, but there's shopping. Uh, and a garb fashion show. And I fell very much in love with uh, doing different themes of clothing every year for Burka. And I became seamstress to the Baroness uh, Maria at the time of Stone March. I have been seamstress to Marguerite, to Thera twice. Uh, Kenrick and Avelina. I was the wardrobe mistress for Brennan Keelan III. And then I did a lot of the sewing for my own reign last summer because that was the only thing that kept me sane. Uh, I had some control. I could make fabric do what I wanted. Uh, and lo, it did. Uh, so I have a wide and varied interest in clothing, in research. I have a problem with Pinterest. I think I have something like 30,000 Pinterest pins. Again, it's a problem. 
uh, and I am not used to using Zoom on my phone like this. There we go. That way I can at least look at myself. Um, yes, so we did things. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Aurelia. Uh, I am, when I started out, I think my very first SCA event, I bought my very first SCA research book, which was a book on uh, Elizabethan uh, clothing, because at the time I thought I wanted to be an Elizabethan. Uh, I will tell you that everyone goes through their own awkward tutor phase. Uh, your awkward tutor phase may not be tutor, uh, but we all go through a phase of like, maybe I like this garb. And then you're like, mm, no, that's not for me. And I very quickly uh, found the Italian Renaissance uh, where I have very happily stayed. Um, but I continue to buy books. Um, not being at Penzik, of course, has meant that I think I bought four or five used books off Amazon this week. Um, most of my, so my research sort of spans from, uh, is focused on 1500s uh, Venice. Uh, Venice is where it's at. Venice is the shit. Venice is where it's at. Venice is uh, Renaissance Vegas um, and everything that entails. Uh, and I primarily tend to dress in the 1520s to 1530s. Uh, that is what I have found works best for me. Uh, I should be wearing sleeves right now, but I'm not. Welcome to my bedroom, my boudoir. I'm on to show. Um, and let's see. Uh, yeah, I, I like Venice. Uh, and I also do a lot of research, like later this afternoon, I'm teaching a class on the history of kissing. Oh, you can see the ladder there. That's maybe not what we want to do. <laughs> uh, so yes, um, I I know we had a last minute cancellation, so I just wanted to fill this spot with answering garb questions. I have done a lot of, like I said, research in a lot of different areas. Uh, Brennan and Keelan were uh, an interesting experience uh, because they wanted to be in Byzantine garb, and I knew nothing about Byzantine garb other than when I went to classes at Penzik uh, focused on what larger ladies should wear in the SCA uh, the advice that was given was oh you should wear Byzantine Byzantine is like big blingy tents and will hide your horrible shameful body and I was like eh, kind of like my horrible shameful body and I don't want to wear a big blingy tent <laughs> Uh, so I very quickly found out that Byzantine is not all big blingy tents. Uh, it is very blingy. It is noxiously blingy. Uh, but I, I learned things about that. Uh, I got to dress Ozer for uh, basically since I adopted him. So we all know the modes of friendship. That really what happens is just an extrovert just gloms onto an introvert until they submit to their will. Uh, that's sort of my relationship with many of my friends and his yarlness, Ozer. Uh, and so I just looked at him and I was like, do you trust me? He goes, of course I trust you. I was like, great. I will never put you in anything I don't think you're going to look good in. And so we expanded his clothing horizons from uh, Norse, which uh, I will say this here and publicly I've done it before. Norse is pajamas. Norse is the majority of men I see out there wearing Norse, it is comfortable, it is baggy pants, and it is basically t-shirts, uh, and it's comfy. But they could, they could expand their horizons, throw a caftan on. There, there are some things we could do with Norse uh, to make it a little less uh, like you're in your PJs, um, but it's comfy. So. Uh, one of my household, uh, Thothraka Rogefa, picked his persona um, by when he could wear pants. Uh, he, <laughs> it's not a mistake. It's, it's comfortable and it's very close to modern clothing in many aspects. 
but they could do better. Um, so Tho came to me and he says, when can I wear pants? So what do you mean? He's like, I want to wear pants. I'm not wearing tights, I'm not wearing leggings, I'm wearing pants. I was like, that's, uh, that's going to be a hard sell, my friend. <laughs> not sure where we can get you where there are pants. So we finally settled on Norse, um, where he could wear pants. And I have taught him how to make his own tunics. We haven't gotten quite to pants. Uh, we've tried. He did get in tights, though. Uh, yeah, I'm getting there, man. He did evolve. <laughs> <laughs> And then I was like, we have a Burka Garb challenge coming up called Beast of the East. And I think a, a blue tiger cod piece is in order. And I'm not about to wear one. Not that you can't and shouldn't. Uh, but would you wear Henry Shin Tudor for me? He goes, I want to wear pants. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got that. But I, I think you'll look real good in Henry Shin Tudor. And uh, he, he submitted to my will, mostly because I sewed it. Um, and he loved that outfit. And he gets so many compliments. He got chased down at Gulf Wars by a woman who was just like, oh, you look so good. <laughs> he came back into camp and he was like, I look really good. <laughs> and we're like, yes. <laughs> Why we put you in that? <laughs> um, so he is, I refer to him as my premier model of the Fortune St. Keen uh, fashion line called Not Together Wear. Uh, where I make clothes for people I am not uh, currently in a relationship with. <laughs> because uh, being a single woman in the SCA, I have sort of uh, developed a theory uh, that if you look about out upon the populace, you can sort of tell who's in a relationship and who's single based on sort of the, the state of the garb. And... Uh, so, you know, the real blingy garb, you're like, hmm, probably has a significant other. The less blingy garb, you're like, hmm, could be single, could be single. Uh, the ones where nothing matches, uh, you're just like, definitely single, definitely single. And then you get the gentlemen who have very nice garb, but it's clearly like in disrepair a little bit. <laughs> you're like, aha, we've broken up. <laughs> Uh, and so I call him the premier model of my not together wear because uh, I try to dress him so he looks like he's in a relationship but isn't. Um. <laughs> right? <laughs> and and again, it's any significant other. And so like, his your allness uh, has a lot of nice garb now. Uh, he is he is not the premier model of not together wear, but he is the second model of not together wear uh, out there. Um, but I also expanded his boundaries, so he was very much in the Norse tunics uh, and the linen garb Viking pants, which are great. They're super comfy, uh, but you can expand your horizons. Try some Thorsberg trousers. What was that hot pick number that he was in? Ah, that was Turkish. I put him in, excuse me, that was hot coral. We're calling that hot coral. I will admit to him putting Brennan the Byzantine that Brennan was in, the Tyrian. Tyrian is a whisper away from hot pink. It is an absolute whisper oh. away from hot pink. Quote and, unquote. Yeah. And uh, his, yeah, his excellency was in hot coral uh, Turkish. Um, I, we actually, I went and found a home deck. Fa okay. So resources. This could be a lecture class. I have a problem with fabric stores. Uh, anywhere I go, I'm going to try to find one. And if you let me find one, I'm going to spend at least three hours in it. Uh, Can where I am. <laughs> hey, we're just driving by the, the Rocky Hill fabric store, and I know we're on our way back from Fenzik, but we could stop, right? No. No, we cannot. <laughs> Um, so like I went out to San Diego a few years ago for my, my cousin Will's wedding, uh, and I found a fabric store out there. Uh, they did not let me on the way to Great Western War find the garment district in LA, which I think is a great plan on the part of my travel companions. Yeah. <laughs> Prax, you come out here. 
I will show you the wonder that is uh, the two ninety nine fabric store. Hey, I've got cousins in New Hampshire. I I should go. You should come out for when we can have events again. <laughs> I will Fortune. take you to all. <laughs> well, Fortune and others who attend Pensick, not just Fortune. Um, there is a small quilting store that I located near Pensick. Um, it is not SCA type stuff, but I was driving by and was like, fabric? Burr! And yeah. uh, with, with the trailer too. Um, <laughs> and they have no place to turn a trailer around, but I didn't care. And I found a place that sold me all of their stock of zippers, um, all stuff I can use for modern sewing. And I was like, yay, this is the best. So I totally understand anywhere you are, go to the fabric store. Go and find the fabric store. You'd be surprised the wools you can find at the quilting stores because they have, um, they'll do like the rug, um, the penny rugs, which yeah. need really nice high-end wools. Um, and you'll walk in, you'll be like, Hoffman. Okay, okay. I love this quilter fabric, quilter fabric, wool. Hello, hello, wool. Um, so if this you were in the- This place lost did not. Uh, this place, so the 299 that's near me, um, it's known as the Auburn Fabric Outlet. It's not actually called the 299. Um, there's one here in Massachusetts. There's one uh, down in Connecticut in Rocky Hill. And I believe there's one in Uncasville, Connecticut as well. Uh, I've only been to Rocky Hill and the one near me. Uh, there's Lorraine's Fabrics. Uh, so I usually start out at the 299 and then I go to a place called Sophisticated, which is in Framingham. Uh, this fabric came from Sophisticated, uh, beautiful silk, uh, shot silk. Uh, it was $10 a yard. I can usually get linen there for about six. Um, very lovely people. And the guy who runs it, Joe, will go on hunts for you. Um, he has a couple of locations uh, in around the Boston area and he will go on fabric hunts for you. I started in the fabric career path um, working for Joann's. I worked for Joann's for about five years. Um, we all make mistakes. Um, I then went to a store called uh, Fabric Place, which was in Framingham, Massachusetts. Uh, I worked there for about two years. We were at our first Penzik when they announced they were shutting down. So I worked in high-end home deck fabrics and upholstery. Um, so that is one of my first loves. Um, so I also will go to high-end. Um, there's a place called Zimmons uh, up in Lynn that has some gorgeous, like you walk in and they've got like the $300 a yard embroidered silks right there and you're just like I mean maybe if I were doing quarter for a four part uh, I could get a three quarters of a yard <laughs> sleeves uh, there's uh, a place that actually has a location in Virginia which is fabric place basement um, I can't remember where in Virginia it's somewhere outside of DC area of Virginia uh, that has a location here. So that's the successor of the place I used to work at. Um, and then there's uh, another chain that is near us. It's a like small owner chain, which is um, Arte's, which has location in Louisiana, has location here, and I think Virginia and Florida. It's a weird, uh, but they have a bargain room that uh, we accidentally kidnapped, Bianca and myself accidentally kidnapped some people from uh, an embroidery scola. And we're like, uh, we're going to go fabric shopping. Anyone wants to just get in the car, <laughs> go enjoy the fabric shopping. So we had um, a question yeah. on the type of Turkish that you made for y'all yeah. Ozer. Um, and I have a photo queued up if you are okay with me. Yeah, please it. Put, up a, put up a photo. Let's see if this works. Please let it not be this one. <laughs> no, oh, it's good. not this one. <laughs> oh, hold on. I'm going to have to turn my background off. Mine is not good in that. I will fully admit that that is a mishmash of styles on myself. Um, and I wholeheartedly stole that coat right off of the gentleman who was Prince of the Mists at the time. I saw him at Gulf Wars. There was a picture of him at Gulf Wars. And I was like, dang, I like that coat. Uh, so it's the cloud collar type coat. And I found a home deck fabric that had those shapes. So that's probably Persian. Yeah. 
the Turks weren't really much into. None of the Turks I know of were much into cloud callers. The reason I ask is people in the SCA often say Turkish, but in SCA period, there are many different Turks. Some of the best known are Uyghurs, Seljuks, and Mamluks. Yep. However, I get the impression that when people in the SCA say Turkish, what they really mean is Ottoman. Yeah, I could have been better on that. Yep. And, and I did do research and, and I knew fully. So that out, those outfits came from, um, I made those. Uh, we had had, I think, six weeks of rain and gloom up here in New England. And it was, <laughs> it was uh, himself and I's first event as King Queen. Oh, I remember why I didn't do that angle. It's because of the, out the ladder. So I'll move over. Um, so I had started out doing sort of the, uh, the layers, the Antari, the Gomlek, the um, words are failing me this morning. I apologize. I have not finished my first coffee. But I had started out doing that, and then I had seen this image of, uh, was it Anton? No, it wasn't Anton. No, God love him. I'd have murdered him. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would have murdered him and taken his coat. So, because he, uh, he was Andre, in was, Persian for one reign as Prince of the Mists. Yes, they did. They stepped down in Persian. Yep. Um, because he looks good in eyeliner. Uh, so, Ozer is Anton's former squire. Um, so Anton came up and lived with us uh, last summer in the East um, for all of that. No, it was, and I cannot remember his name, but he's adorable. He's got reddish hair and like a beard. Um, and uh, he had gotten the, the cloud collar. And so I took a right turn about a week before the event um, and started to do the cloud collar on his because uh, it was so horribly dreary and the event we were going through was uh Belfast challenge which is either beautifully sunny and horribly windy or a giant mud pit and icy rain uh we failed our saving throw particularly because we had anton there um and it was prince of the mist keeps bringing that rain <laughs> a rain bringer so um, not last Australia, the Australia before we went out there for, um, as Prince and Princess and Ozer is known as Stormborn. The day he won crown tournament, uh, right as he won, a storm blew through and knocked out power to the camp. Uh, we had white caps on the lake. It was, you can hear in the final bouts, you can hear all the rain and the branches coming down on the top of the building. Anton, it was his last day. He was stepping down as Prince of the Mists. And there, Anton's night was Prince of Oertha uh, that day. So we call it Three Princes Day. Uh, but yes, he brought the storm. And so when we went to Estrella, uh, they had that once in a hundred year flooding issue. <laughs> Because they, they've was, had that at at least three Estrellas I've been to. Oh man, we, we were just, it was miserable. So we're in camping in with the West and just, it is freezing cold at night and inches of water and mud. And we're just like, I don't think we can do this. But it was the day it, it rained was Ozer's 30th birthday. So we, we blame him for the storm. It was him and Anton being in the same place together. And then Ryu, who is known as a, uh, the Eastern God of Thunder, uh, was off-site. We finally got to do the cancer tourney at Estrella. And at the very end of it, it starts hailing and there's thunder. And we get this text. And Ryu's like, I'm almost back to site. And we're like, God damn it, Ryu. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a way to counteract Anton's storm bringerness, uh, his rain bringerness, um, which is you have to sing uh, Toto's Africa three times through. <laughs> uh, we had to do that at Penzik. Uh, we had uh, a bit of rain at Penzik. Of course, the one night we were anticipated rain it was during Eastern Court. And so half of the populace is in Ozra and I's basically dressing room and the throne area. 
the other half of the populace is over in a big tent and we're all like singing Africa <laughs> to try to get it to go away. <laughs> um, which it did for about 45 minutes. Unfortunately, we had 50 minutes left of court. <laughs> uh, so we ended up taking fealty from somebody in the rain. It's okay. She forgave us. Uh, but yeah, that, that is the way you counteract it. There's a video up on YouTube of all of us in, in the dressing room singing Africa by Toto. Yeah, well, you, you have to expect to get a little wet at Penzik. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, just didn't want it that night. I'm a, I'm a good New Englander. I'm, I'm not afraid of weather, uh, but that was not, that was not what I wanted to have happen that evening, but I cannot control everything. I'm not in charge of the weather. So yes. Um, yeah. So I am, uh, completely, this is a please ask me your questions type thing. I can go over my process on how I research outfits and go through them. Uh, otherwise we can just chat. This was sort of a filler in for something that got canceled. I have done similar things like this and I've gone through my sewing basket. So I have that here and I've got a few examples of garb over there uh, if we need stuff, but 15th century Florentine garb construction. Well, First thing you need to know about Florentines is they're stuffy. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I agree with this statement. Yeah. So the, one of the ways you can think about Florence and Venice is Venice is like New York City and Florence is like Boston. Um, so Florence is very sort of we're very refined. We ban things. We we have culture. <laughs> and New York City's sort of like, pew, pew, we got that too, but we got fun. <laughs> and I say this as someone who lives in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, so yes, what is what is our question, Aurelia? I would love to answer it. So first of all, my my whole persona is based around the fact that I'm a painter and so Florence makes sense. I love mm -hmm. Florence. But I travel so I could do everything I want to do. So I'm working on building more persona appropriate garb, um, which I'm not completely, it's like pushing my level of sewing knowledge. Um, so I made my first uh, Gamara and I have, it's, I, I read different articles on, on how to stiffen the bodice and it mm -hmm. said canvas. So I used some of my painting canvas, which is like really thick. And I have the, it, the dress I made basically stands up on its own. Yes. And I don't know if that's right. And if it I so one of my favorite, um, so one of my favorite ways to look at those uh, things is if you find Susanna and the elders, if you find different representations of Susanna and the elders, you get a great snapshot of what they are using for bathing products. Um, but also you usually see clothing without a human in it in the background because she's naked. Um, the other thing, um, there's a Venus, and I don't know which Venus it is, um, but it's the one where she's leaning out like this, and there are two serving women in the back, and they're going through her cassone, they're going through the big charts, short, uh, big chests, and they're throwing garb over their shoulders. And you'll notice if you look at both of those dresses, they stand up on their own. Um, so if you look at, I believe it's Titian, it's probably Tintoretto, but I believe it's Titian. It's has Titian. A Susanna, it's yeah. Titian. Um, has a Susanna and the Elders where her dress is behind her, and you can tell the dress is on the ground and is standing up by itself. So yes, it should do that. Did you cut it on the straight of grain, or did you do it on the bias? Your interior canvas level. It's okay if you don't remember. <laughs> I think I did it straight. Okay, so it's gonna be a little stiffer. Like if you find that's too stiff for you, try cutting it on the bias. Uh, it'll give it a little more give. Um, I also, when I interface with canvas, so like this has a, um, a heavier cotton twill as the inside, um, sometimes it makes the dress look too flat. So like if I'm dealing with 
a silk or something that wants to look like silk, I will put a layer of cotton flannel in as well as an interlining and it gives it that just a little bit more plushness to the look. So you don't get that flatness um, to it, but yes, it, it should. Um, and that'll, it'll soften up over time. We don't wear our clothes as much in the SCA as of course they would have done in period, you know, you're, you've got three dresses, you're going to rotate them out and they're very quickly going to sort of mold to you um, and get that lived in-ness, but yeah, it should be that stiff because it, it is doing part of the, the heavy lifting, shall we say? Um, yeah. Um, Great. So well, that's a reason to wear garb at home during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had to... I had to go run through and my, my totes and be like, shit, clothes. I should probably wear garb for this. Um, yeah, so it was one of the reasons to wear your garb through the pandemic. Uh, if you are an Instagram person, um, there's uh, Prior Attire, which, which is one of the um, historical sewing folks. Um, she and her partner have started doing costume constitutionals. Uh, where they just put on their garb and they go for a walk in the neighborhood or they go for a walk at a local park. And I'm like, that is the cutest thing I've ever seen. Uh, so I've tried that. My neighbors are super thrilled uh, <laughs> here in Worcester. <laughs> but whatever, they should have gotten used to it. My local honeydew doesn't even ask anymore. They're just like, ah, the weird lady's back. Coffee? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, we have so, yeah. a question in the chat about making garb accessible and making garb on a tight budget. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, so there are certain types of garb that are really, um, anyone else see the butterfly? Okay. <laughs> there are certain types of garbs that are really easy construction. So if you're looking at something like uh, Greek, Roman, um, those are rectangles, those are big tubes. Those are rectangles and pins. The getting the amount of fabric be on your SCA yard sale, be on um, Barter Town, go to, and unfortunately, one of my uh, things here is going to be thrifting. And right now, thrifting is not really a thing, but when it is again, uh, every Savers I have ever been to has a fabric section, a material section. Go and look in there. Um, also, for chemises, things like that. Sheets work well. Sheets also work well as a uh, patterning fabric. Um, I have often wanted, I have not done it yet, I have often wanted to host a garb challenge where the majority of your things are things you have thrifted um, because I think there is too much emphasis on the bright new and shiny. I am a, a uh, persimmonous Yankee. Uh, I will have a heart attack if you ask me to pay more than $10 a yard for fabric for the most part. Um, I will start to, all right. <laughs> um, it has to be something real special. Uh, so I have found ways to find bargains. I have found linen at Walmart. Uh, check your, I don't know if the fabric sections of Walmarts are opened up again. I know my local one in the height of the pandemic was not selling fabric. Uh, my other secret to buying fabric at Walmart is to go off hours and try to buy fabric um, because I used to do this all the time in college is I would show up in the evenings and Steve, the guy from Sporting Goods, would have to cut my fabric and he never figured out the tells on correctly. And so he would just be like, all right, five yards. And then he would just scan it and I would get five yards for whatever the buy the yard price was. Um, it's not stealing if the employee does it. <laughs> um, or they'd be like, oh, you waited a really long time. I'll just do half off on this. Like, okay, sure. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> I don't come here specifically for you. That's totally wrong and unethical. Um, but there are a lot of different ways. Also, go to your local Chatelaines, uh, and there's usually stuff that they have in their gold key. Um, the loaner clothing that hasn't been out in a while. Um, maybe it's a weird, uh, you know, it's an off shape or they don't have the rest of the outfits. Um, you know, see what they might be willing to trade and barter away um, as well. 
we don't do enough SCA yard sale stuff because I know all of us end up as hoarders. Uh, my household has done a yard sale in the past um, where we have just put stuff out uh, to sort of get rid of. Um, but find stuff that you can remake, find stuff that's really easy construction wise. Um, buy materials you can reuse. So I've always, I'm always on the hunt when I'm in used clothing stores for leather jackets. Yeah. Uh, I really want a leather um, doublet that has all little pinked uh, shapes out of it. I'm not about to construct out of garment leather. I would really rather find a leather jacket I could take apart. Um, go on at Facebook Marketplace. You'd be amazed what's on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist as well. Uh -huh. Heloise mentioned um, thrift stores for cotton sheets for kids' garb and linen tablecloths too. Could be a, a good mm. tip. You will find really nice sheets that have like embroidered edging. Um, and I saw that about the wheelchair and I will get back to it. Um, you'll find really nice sheets that have embroidered edging and things like that. Um, it, maybe there's a stain on the rest of it. Maybe there's something issue. You can take parts of parts apart. Um, uh, one of my household has a bunch of purple leather that somebody was getting rid of a couch. They were redoing a leather couch uh, and she scarpered off with the leather bits uh, for that. Uh, you'd be amazed what is out there, especially folks who are um, going through a parent, a parent's house uh, who has passed away or grandparents, um, what they have out there on Facebook Marketplace that they just don't know they have. I'm on there quite often uh, because what is a pandemic without some recreational shopping? Um, and there's often home deck fabric in places that just, they don't need it. They're done with it. They don't know what the rest of it is for. Um, it becomes a bit of a job to try to find it, uh, but you can really find some great deals and definitely, you know, I have bartered garb for all sorts of things for help setting up tents uh, for uh, half of a pig. Uh, somebody had a uh, pig that they had butchered and my household got half of it uh, for our Penzik meal plan one year and he got a couple of tunics. Um, so see what you can do. Um, but you'd be amazed what's out there, uh, especially folks who are trying to get rid of fabric out there on the yard sale and barter town and your local events you'd be amazed we have a question from rosie about 14th century southern france um so yeah i picked my persona due to a particular time period because what was going on is what i needed for my persona um and i don't like all the fancy late period stuff. Um, so when I was looking, I know nothing. I have tunics and I have a few kind of nice dresses. Um, but there's everything. I can't figure out what I'm supposed to do. It would be like pre-plague, early 1300s. Um, and there's big sleeves and tight sleeves and sideless sir coats that have big holes and ones that don't have big holes. And I mean, there's all sorts. How do I know what's what? So one of the, my favorite resources is the World Gallery of Art um, website where you can plug in their search function and you can say time period and region and what type of art you're looking for and look through it that way. The um, The big holes versus little holes on the surcoats uh, has to do some with ceremonial. So when they stop being more of a functional garment and become more ceremonial, they get very, very narrow. Um, but also it has to do with uh, trendiness and age. Um, 
So you will notice when you look at pictures, um, when you look at the individuals, like what, what are, what's the age range of the person wearing it? Is this a younger person's thing? Is this a sort of, hey baby, I'm marriageable, check out my gates of hell. Um, you see, uh, was it more like the Maness Codex has the surcoats that are basically almost tabards. Um, they basically uh, have a hole at the top and very small armholes. Um, uh, so one of the things that I do is, is start there at World Gallery of Art and look at the representations and then I will sit there and I will go and I will uh, look at um, in, in period you're looking usually if there is a representation of individuals uh, there's a lot of allegorical uh, there's very little secular art it's a lot of allegorical and um, for the church so you want to know sort of what the story is because that's also may inform what they're wearing um and then it comes down to also some of your personal preference um so let's see the tight sleeves versus wider sleeves um they tend to be different layers so look at what time of the year they're wearing it so the tighter sleeved tended to be an under layer that you could put the optional um, larger sleeved garment over on top of and then however big the sleeves are also depends on informs sort of what you're doing because the big pendant sleeves are good for nothing other than looking real pretty um, they uh, they aren't going to be very functional if you need to do things like cook dinner or wash dishes or I'd love to cook over a campfire with those that sounds great yeah, right. <laughs> um, I've seen people tie them back behind themselves, but uh, I just take them off. So you've got a basic block that is a tighter to the body kirtle. Um, sure, we'll like have the Cranford in. Uh, you've got a tighter to the body sort of dress or kirtle uh, that has various overlayers. Um, and it just depends on, so like if you're at Penzik, you probably don't want your overlayers. Um, you can look at um, I think it's historic enterprises has a couple of really nice bleo patterns um, where they have the undergarment with the sort of ruched sleeve the tight ruched sleeve here uh, if you do that out of linen you will not be any more hot than any other thing that you wear uh, linen is a miracle fiber uh, for the in the warm time in the uh, real warm environments uh, and then if you had a so maybe like a summer a light, lighter weight wool um, to do an overgarment out of you could either do the sort of um, the surcoat but I really think uh, you get a lot more mileage out of um, more like the bleo uh, type that goes over I apologize. My neighbor's dog, for some reason, has decided hates the FedEx guy. Um, so yeah, there, you have a so think of it in layers. So if you start out with your base under layers, uh, and you get that done, so that's going to be more tighter to the body, but not. So we have a fascination in the SCA with the super tight coat hoodies and the body conforming, and that's not really what you see the average person wearing um because you change shapes they change shapes just like we do now um you go through different cycles in your life you change your shape um so you start out with a basic underlayer i would say with the tight sleeves the long tight sleeves and then build on your overlayers you know if you have a, a two or three basic underdresses you have one larger sleeved overdress and you have a surcoat, you have a huge amount of options now for outfits uh, that you can do. Did any of that make sense? Oh yeah, thanks, that's good. <laughs> yeah. 
So start with your base layers and, and move out. But yeah, your base layer is going to be closer to the skin and, and going to have the long, long sleeves. All right, Bianca, what's my next one? We have a question about specific groups for adapting garb for disabilities. I don't know much about this. I'm not going to pretend I know much about this. Um, unfortunately, uh, I probably should know more about this. Um, one of the things I know, breathability is key, natural fibers. Um, uh, one of my champions, uh, Krishna, uh, was in a wheelchair and did a lot of uh, Ottoman because she could wear the salwar pants and have the beautiful jacket over it and then also remove layers if she needed to. Um, because you're seeing against uh, the chair throughout the day, you tend to need more ventilation um, and things. Um, what I'm sure any time period can be adapted. Uh, one of the things I really like is hook and loop tape. Uh, instead of putting on specific hooks and eyes, hook and loop tape works, uh, um, hook and eye tape, I should say that. Hook and loop is, you're going to get Velcro. Hook and eye tape, that's better. Um, if you're looking on ways to get in and out of things um, easily. Um, but yeah, I, I also recommend, uh, instead of doing regular hooks and eyes in a lot of my garb, I will do a skirt hook and eye, uh, which is the, it's, it's like a larger, flatter, hold on. Let me see if I got one. <sighs> There are a number of SCA disability groups on Facebook. I haven't found any specifically for clothing, but you might ask in some of them because people have probably had to adapt garb. Especially as the SCA is aging, um, that is going to be more and more a thing for us. And um, becoming more inclusive. Agreed. Um, one of the things we tried to do was, um, make sure that if we were at an event we and we were doing court it was on the flat ground so that people didn't have to try to get up and down stairs i know meridies has just developed a kneeling bench slash um cushion hybrid um that they've been using to help people get up and down uh and to sit instead of kneel um because that becomes an issue. Apparently I don't have any on me. I believe the East has one now as well because I was seated on something before Her Majesty for my elevation. I, some sort of bench thing that like flipped over. I'm guessing that's what you were talking about. Yeah, so yeah, they definitely, I, I hadn't, I, I didn't make that event so I, I didn't see it, but I'm sure it's in there in storage. And someday when we can have events again, when we can have events again, uh, that will come out again. Yeah, I don't have a skirt and hook and eye. But a skirt and hook and eye has a um, sort of a D-shaped piece of metal and it, uh, once it is hooked in, it sort of latches into itself a lot more securely than your average hook and eye. Um, but I, any of your tricks of the trade for modern clothing, I think are going to work, but I would look at like something with the big sleeves isn't going to work in a lot of the cases. I'm sure you could get it to work, but it's going to be more effort. Um, I mean, like but, these ones, the skirt hook and eyes like these? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love those because those are less likely to come undone uh, when you're doing stuff and you're moving around and you're shifting than your regular hooks and eyes. Um, I just got a pack of uh, rare earth uh, magnets to play around with, also for closures on things, for more non-SEA stuff, but I can't see why you couldn't adapt it. I put a frog on the outside and I put a magnet, magnets behind it. Who's to say what it is? Um, there are, you kind of have to dig for them. I think if you call, like look for fur hook and eyes, they have much bigger hook and eyes or, or yeah, hook and eyes. Um, that I've used more successfully than the small ones. 
Um, like on my elevation garb, I had larger hook and eyes on the front and it stayed much more securely and it's easier to, to do and undo. Yeah, and I know I've um, talked with folks who um, have a son who has uh, sensory issues and so sometimes needing to get in and out of clothing quickly because it just has become intolerable uh, is a thing and we have just talked about you know what nobody is going to uh, give you trouble so sort of like this size kit I don't have the other piece to this one I don't know what happened to it sorry I'm muted um, a little bit smaller than that one but I use the really long hook I'll grab them yep. Hold on. Yep. And also look into um, metal workers. Uh, I know uh, Robert uh, Luis Garcia of um, he he has made me hook and eyes. Um, so look into somebody who's going to who is doing metal work. Uh, they may be able to do a little bit of wire work and make you a more custom hook and eye uh, that would work better. Um, has that longer hook maybe. Uh, to keep it in there. I've also used uh, jewelry closures. Um, so like uh, the decorative hooks and eyes that you can get for uh, closing a necklace. I've used that as closures as well. Um, These are the ones I used on my Vesta. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, fingertip sized. Um, but this is more like a, a fur one where it's got the yeah. casing around it. Yep. And for the sleeves, I use the ones that match these. So the, yep. the actual hook is about that long. And all I did was I hooked it into loops and my sleeve stayed perfectly all day. No fiddling with ties or anything. You're welcome, Ranjan. I'm glad that was good. If you need anything, reach out to me. I'm on the Facebooks. Um, I'm willing to, uh, to brainstorm and come up with solutions. All right, the anchor. Yes, we are at a couple minutes to one. So any last questions? How do we get here so quickly? I know. We're all just having too much fun. Eloise, first of all, wear whatever you gosh darn well please. <laughs> um, Fancy. So everyone's def definition of fancy is going to be different. Um, as to what can you do with a lot of bling. So you're looking at later period. Um, one of the things I might even do, even though it's more of a, um, so look at like the Eleanor of Toledo gown. So Eleanor of Toledo was suffering. shaped yes <laughs> Eleanor of Toledo was suffering with um a lot of medical problems at the end of her life she was in a full metal corset to, to keep her sort of upright um but if the trim lines on that gown emphasize the the sort of triangle shape and then you also have the skirts that flow out so not only can you get in a lot of bling options with that trim, the trim shape is gonna help you get that figure. Um, you may have a bum roll or a, a small hip roll underneath that's gonna get the skirts if you attach those skirts as um, either stacked box pleats. So they really have a lot of poof. Uh, you can do um, cartridge pleating as well because the cartridge pleats are gonna wanna swing uh, the way they're attached out. Um, yeah. And that's going to that, that style of dress. So if you're looking at late period, the Elizabethans, the Spanish, the Italians, those dresses, your body is conforming to that dress. Um, so that dress is giving you the shape. It's not particularly you that have that shape. And it's all about proportion. You're emphasizing the hips. You're getting that hourglass out that way. Uh, oh, it's almost like I have a class at two. Um, you're getting the, sh 
the the hips and the shape out that way, which is going to help you feel, I think, um, you get the shoulder rolls even sometimes, but it's going to help you get that, um, that feel. And also that's a time period that specifically had hair pieces. If you're, um, you've got short hair or sort of non SCA compliant hair, um, that's a time period where very specifically you're, you're buying hair. Um, it's my hair. I bought it. Um, you can get, uh, braided buns. Um, Boguewigs.com is where I've gotten a bunch of mine. I've also gotten some off of AliExpress where I, and uh, some from Claire's. Post prom season, Claire's actually sells uh, braided buns. Yeah. Um, so you put your hair back. So I used to have very short, very, very short hair. Um, I would put my hair back in a ponytail and it, it it's a bun that has combs in it already in. I would sew some pearls in that and just clip it into my ponytail at the back. Um, and I would get that look. Um, you can also do the snoods uh, and various things. Uh, there's a lot of bling, a lot of jewelry. Who doesn't like a lot of jewelry? Um, but that's where I would go. I would go like six, uh, 15, 50s, 1560s. 50s, so you're not fully into like the ridiculous, like I can't sit down cones, um, but you're, you're doing a more natural shape. Um, if you want to be buttoned full up to the collar, look at Spain and you like black. The, the Spanish at that time period, goth. <laughs> um, the Florentines also have the double gowns. Um, that go all the way up to the neck as well. Also work great for fencing. Um, but yeah, put a ton of gold bling on shit. Uh, get those pearls on a rope from Joann's that are in the little clearance bins. Um, weave those into a couple fake hair pieces. Uh, you'll get fake braids with pearls going through them. Um, there are a ton of tutorials out there on YouTube on making your own wigs from hair pieces. Definitely go and check those out. Um, we also have a courtesan who makes hair pieces. Um, she's under Zephrine on Facebook, but her SCA yep. name is Bienvenue. Yep. She made my hair pieces that I'm not wearing because I'm wearing Roman. <laughs> because it's hot and you should. <laughs> um, but yeah, like definitely like look into hair pieces. And I am a huge fan of AliExpress. Uh, which is cheap jewelry direct, direct from China. Um, and also going to your um, your savers, your estate sales, your, you know, all this, there's some old school, like Avon had a line of jewelry uh, that went along with the Lady and the Unicorn tapestries, which I've gotten a couple pieces of. You know, I have a big ring, shockingly, I have giant rings uh, that was meant to hold solid perfume that they put out for a little while. Um, they have necklaces that go with that. Um, again, this is digging to get all the bling, but this is a building, you know, this necklace, the base of this necklace came off AliExpress. This is from Crown and Chalice. These came from Charming Charlie, which still exists on its, in its online form. Uh, I miss actual physical Charming Charlie locations because they were the best. Uh, if you've got a Burlington, Burlington's got a great jewelry section for stuff you can take apart. Um, and cheap, uh, and then, uh, you know, go through, you know, your clearance sales at Michael's, your clearance sales at Joann's. Um, actually, TJX, I have gotten um, some really good jewelry at TJ Maxx, uh, Marshalls. I know, right? <laughs> Burlington. You'd be amazed what you can find at Burlington. They have a home goods section, too. Like, I've definitely taken apart a bracelet to make clasps for Roman from Burlington. Yep. Taking apart bracelets. They have a home deck section. Uh, definitely uh, exploit what you can from, from, and they always have a, a section for like sort of prom jewelry. Um, shoes. I have gotten great shoes um, that have been intended to be uh, leather house slippers, uh, Turkish slippers. Um, 
that have been, yeah, no, please continue to snooze, um, that have been uh, gotten those off of AliExpress as well. And sometimes Amazon, but usually whatever I'm looking at at Amazon, I can get half as cheap again um, off of AliExpress if I just wait. I'm very patient. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Charming Charlie used to be my absolute favorite place to go in and buy bracelets to take apart to do, like, the jewelry on um, Kaitons. Uh, now that we don't have physical Charming Charlies anymore, uh, Burlington is now my favorite place for that. Uh, they, they've got a lot of jewelry. So the, the thing is to, to, you have to take your, you have to train your eye to look at the pieces that things are and not necessarily their final form. So I know I got a uh, necklace from uh, Walmart like a year ago that was a bib necklace of what looked like faux uh, rose quartz. And if you looked at the pieces, the individual pieces had loops for each stone on either side and could easily be taken apart and made into chiton attachments. Uh, which is what currently it is sitting in my jewelry box waiting to do. Um, so like these were part of a bracelet from Charming Charlie. Um, they came with some really ridiculous rhinestones around them, but if you looked at the individual pieces, um, and I'm always, always, I'm always looking when I'm out shopping, when I could go out shopping. Um, for those sort of things. Cool. Anything else? Final thoughts? I'm almost done with my iced coffee. <laughs> Before we go, can I just share something that is fun? Yeah. Sure. This is my new fan. <laughs> oh, wow. I don't know if you guys can see that. That is gorgeous. Um, the stick is supposed to be arriving hopefully before this weekend or else I won't get to use it this weekend. But um, DSA threads is machine making needle lace style fans. And uh, she's on Etsy, correct? Uh, yes, she is. And she's also on Facebook. And, um, you know, for, for those of you who may have always wanted one of these, here's, here's a good chance. <laughs> How are you going to attach it to the stick? Are you going to just stitch it on or? No, small nails. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like little tiny, like almost. Uh, like furniture tax. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have one that somebody made for me that swings around the stick. Yeah. Um, but that, that gets into, yeah, he had to make, like, he had to take, like, the, uh, the brass um, Roman, Roman shade rings. From mm -hmm. somewhere and thread cover them to do it, um, but yeah, those I have been I have been watching DSA threads uh, on Etsy because there's one that has like Star Wars stuff and I was like, oh, oh. My, my Star Wars shift could uh my my solo Han Solo outfit could probably use some some lace. We shall see. Well, she yeah. she does you know if there's something specific that you want that she's not already offering like this fan I was like. Hey Amber, we're gonna push you to the next level, and you're gonna sell these once I get the first one. And she's like, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so she's pre pre ordering them now until I get the nice pictures probably this weekend of them of the fan for her. Um, but you she know what her stitching to digitize and work out. What was that? Do you know what her hoop size is? What's her max hoop size? About this size, which okay. is I think it's about eight by twelve. Or eight by ten. Okay. Yeah. So, because I have a I have a brother P eight hundred, um, which is a five by seven, and I, I love her. I love her so much. That was my end of rain present to me. Um, uh, nice. But but you always yeah you then have to like put things together with tiny little whip stitches and stuff. But being able to do that all in one, yeah. Because Hastings of course uh, does the amazing uh, motif research, mm -hmm. which. I love looking at um, yeah and someday someday I will go through all of it and get a, a custom coronet 
from those designs, but that day is not today. I'm exhausted. All right. What time are we at, Bianca? We are at 110, so I think we're good. This was very informative. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, at two o'clock, I will be teaching the history of kissing. You should all come back for that. But in between, I'm probably going to try to get some lunch and pray fervently that I do not drop anything on myself. <laughs> That's always a challenge. <laughs> always the, always the, the problem. All right. Thank you all. Thank Any you. Wonderful. Questions? Yep. Feel free to reach out. Thank you.